From your 24-hour news source, this is a Channel 4 News Update. Brought to you by Williamson Cadillac, Dadeland and Homestead. Good evening, I'm Tom Reitles. Here's what's happening. Police looking for a missing four-year-old retarded child found the boy's naked body inside a cardboard box sealed under concrete on his back porch in Leavenworth, Kansas. On the nightcast, a follow-up report beat the train. A deadly game many South Floridians are playing, but tonight, cops are changing the rules. We'll tell you how on the nightcast. Good evening, I'm Jane Pauley. And I'm Stone Phillips. Welcome to Dateline NBC. Tonight on Dateline NBC. A devastating drug problem we don't hear much about. Medication error in U.S. hospitals. It's about just totally ignoring the fact that people are dying. It kills more than 3,500 people every year. And for the families of the victims, saying we're sorry just isn't enough. When I want to talk to my son now, I go to his grave. Tonight, Stone Phillips reports on the danger of mixed up medicines in prescriptions for disaster. Then, unsuspecting senior citizens say they've been conned out of millions of dollars in campaign contributions. I'd call him a crook. A man who gets around campaign laws. He infuriates politicians. Makes you want to punch him in the nose. Brian Ross confronts one of the biggest political fundraisers in America. Is what you're doing now is outrageous. You're a liar. Tonight, and you're a, a man who goes after older people's money. And I'll introduce you to two young men and their families coping with the challenge of Down syndrome. Achieving what was thought impossible. He has all the same hopes, dreams, goals, plans of any other red-blooded American teenager. They're making all sorts of plans. But you think you could do it? Yes. Because of the way I saw my charm. Your charm. Yeah. Tonight, we'll bring you a story of great inspiration, a story of great expectations. Mitch, you be cool, all right? This is Dateline NBC with correspondents Brian Ross, Michelle Gillen, Arthur Kent, and Deborah Roberts. Now, from our studios in New York, here are Stone Phillips and Jane Pauley. Welcome to our first show. Stone and I will be here every Tuesday night at 10 with stories of our times. From the places where people are making news, Datelines, which is how we chose our name. Tonight, Stone begins with a story about misplaced faith in our medical system. How careful are your doctors or their aides in prescribing or giving you drugs? The answer may be not nearly careful enough. The result, medication mix-ups that have victimized thousands of Americans. They are prescriptions for disaster. Well, I like she'll be coming around the mountain, Frank, as it really gets you going. Ready? She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming around. Despite her constant encouragement, Janice Reben's son Frank hasn't sung a note or spoken a word in years. The hardest part is remembering what he used to be like. Everybody loved him. He was a good kid. You know, we dig out the movies and, you know, you watch him and then he's this little kid running around after the ball and playing baseball and and remembering what he was and missing what he could be. Frank was a normal, healthy 10-year-old growing up in Tucson when his life was changed forever by a drug overdose. It happened not in a crack house, but in a doctor's office. He had tonsillitis, and they gave him a shot of penicillin in his thigh. And the next morning, he couldn't walk. His leg was, like, locked up, and he was in a lot of pain. He came in and the doctor saw him and decided that it was just the natural tenderness that you get from a shot. Ernestine Miller was one of the nurses assisting the doctor that day. He asked me to go get Tylenol for the child, and I went and got two tablets. Frank's throat was too sore to swallow the Tylenol tablets, so instead he was offered liquid Tylenol. A nurse helping Ernestine Miller had already poured it from a bottle on the doctor's medicine shelf. 
But in fact, what she'd poured was another red liquid, liquid cocaine, a powerful anesthetic used in surgery that should never be swallowed. Frank went into convulsions within minutes. I, I just stood there and I couldn't believe it. And, and I was like, oh, God. And, you know, they, they kept trying to jab him, you know, like I said, to start this IV. And I asked, could, could you please call an ambulance? You know, please call an ambulance. What was the first thing that went through your mind when you realized you'd made an error? Panic. You, there's no feeling like it when you make a medication error and you, it, and you realize that you've made it. You, uh, you, you think, oh my God, what have I done? The reality is that Frank is 20 years old right now. He has the mentality of about a year old baby. I mean, we kid him all the time. We, we tell him if you say a word, we'll go buy you a Mercedes or something. You know, we'll go get you the Corvette, you know, say a word, you know. Uh, he'll never drive, he won't date, he'll never marry. That's, that's hard. You know, um, what were his last words to you? And he looked at my husband and he said, um, Dad, I'm not going to die, am I? <laughs> Let's go. Come on, come on. Let's go over this way. Let's go over here. Come on. To meet Frank Rebin and hear his story is to come face to face with a nationwide drug here, problem huh? you don't hear much about. Right. The fact is, accidents like the one that destroyed Frank's future happen every day. According to the American Medical Association, there are as many as 56,000 medication errors each day in hospitals across the country. And that doesn't include mix-ups like the one in Frank's case that happen in doctor's offices. Most are caught before damage is done, but not all of them. Neil Davis and Michael Cohen are pharmacists and founders of the Institute for Safe Medication Practice. And what we try to do is investigate all the errors because even though an error is not serious today, the next error tomorrow might be a fatal error. And we don't want this to happen to anybody, and we feel, feel that uh, in almost all cases, these accidents can be avoided. It is estimated that as many as 10 Americans die each day because they were given the wrong medicine. Cohen and Davis say the problem is that too many drugs look alike, as in the case of Frank Rebin. Drug names often sound alike. Labels are hard to read, and handwritten prescriptions are even harder to read. Take a look at these. This one, if you give it as a direct injection into the IV tubing, it's helpful. It's going to maybe save a life. If you give this one as a direct injection, you can kill someone. This one is used every day in the hospital as a, as a, a replenishment for electrolytes, chemicals that you lose. This one, if you give it, it could kill you if you give it by direct injection. And yet both of them are packaged very similar. They're both packaged very point. similar, yes. When we told Cohen and Davis about the mix-up in Frank Rebin's case, they weren't surprised at all. It's kind of like when you go to a, a supermarket and go to get a can of Diet Pepsi and come home with a regular Pepsi. You have a picture in your mind's eye of what the product's supposed to look like, and you sometimes grab the wrong container. One drug that's being grabbed by mistake in ambulances and emergency rooms across the country is this heart medicine called lidocaine. To speed delivery during emergency situations, drug companies sell it in ready-to-use syringes. But a lot of drugs are packaged that way, and there's been a lot of confusion. Actress Linda Garinger, whom you may recognize from the TV show Evening Shade, was called by a Dallas hospital in October 1990 and told that her husband, Ken Bryant, had been in a minor car accident. Though Ken wasn't seriously injured, Linda went to the hospital anyway. And uh, somebody met me with his wallet in his wedding ring, a chaplain did, and said, um, you know, would you like to come into a room and say a prayer? And I, I didn't understand what was going on because they had said he was in a minor car accident and there was nothing wrong with him. But in fact, a paramedic at the crash scene had given Ken the wrong drug. Instead of dextrose to prevent shock, he injected Ken with a highly concentrated dose of lidocaine. The packaging of the two drugs is very similar. This is the voice of the paramedic after he realized his mistake. Okay, I gave him lidocaine by mistake. I gave him one apple lidocaine by mistake. Within minutes, Ken suffered a heart attack and later died. Cohen and Davis say the mix-up that led to Ken Bryant's death has been happening for years. This is about 50 adverse drug reports right here in this pile that were sent to FDA that we have on file. All related to lidocaine. All of them, serious injuries or death related to overdoses with that lidocaine syringe. Uh, there are indeed 
a number of reports of mix-ups, and FDA has been looking at the matter well, as long ago as four years ago, we had... Peter Reinstein is with the Food and Drug Administration, the government agency responsible for approving all drug labels and packaging. Stone, it's not complicated to come up with a different-looking package. It's complicated to come up with something that will, in the overall scheme of things, reduce medication errors, not introduce new medication errors. We have a system that actually works pretty well. That's ridiculous. It's just, it's out of control. It's not even about someone having a bad day. It's about, it's about just totally ignoring the fact that people are dying. 40 people die as a result of confusion over the prepackaged labels and look of lidocaine. And yet there's been no change in the packaging, in the look. We're continuing to look at the problem, but Stone, let me remind you that no matter what kind of change you make in the packaging, there's no substitute for read the label, read the label, read the label. I agree that people should read the label. Uh, we tell them to read the label three times, but let's face it, people on occasion, they're gonna be careless. On, a pay, on occasion, they're rushed. They don't always do what they're supposed to do. Like most hospitals, Duke University Medical Center in North Carolina was supposed to have a system to catch those occasional careless mistakes, which makes the story of five-year-old Brandon Quintero all the more disturbing. Brandon was a curious and energetic child. Last year, he developed a benign tumor on his left arm that required treatment. Hoping to find the best possible care for Brandon, his mother, Tammy, brought him to Duke, where doctors decided to try and shrink the tumor with chemotherapy. But shortly after his first injection, Brandon became strangely ill. And as his condition worsened, one of his doctors told Tammy that something had gone wrong. I was sitting beside Brandon's bed, and I was patting his hand, and he came in the room, and he got down on his knees. He held my hand. And he said, Miss Quintero, he said, um, Brandon was given the wrong medication. And he was given about four times too much. In this case, the mix-up wasn't over drugs that look alike or come in similar packages. The problem here began on a handwritten prescription where a doctor confused two drugs with similar names. The prescription called for the drug Valban, but the doctor wrote the wrong generic name below it, Vincristine instead of vinblastine. No one caught the error. An order was written, written incorrectly. Victor Stolten is chief administrator of the Duke okay. University Medical Center. The doctor who wrote the prescription obviously didn't catch the mistake. The morning shift pharmacist didn't catch it. The supervising physician who verified it didn't catch it. Neither did the afternoon shift pharmacist or the IV room pharmacist or the doctor who finally gave it to Brandon. How could so many people fail to catch such a serious mistake? I don't have a good answer for that. I think the issue that, and I know that the issue the medical center is dealing with is, for some reason, it was not caught. 13 days after the accident, another one of the doctors told Tammy that there was something she should know about Brandon. And I just got a funny feeling in my gut, and I said, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that there's a possibility that my son could die? And she looked straight at me and she said, he is gonna die. And I got hysterical and I was screaming and she said, well, he's got about a 10% chance. And I said, what the hell is 10%? And I just kept screaming and telling my father, I said, they, they've killed him. I said, they said he's going to die. They've killed him. Brandon died the next day. Since Brandon's death, Duke has tightened its procedures for writing, checking, and filling prescriptions. Only certain doctors can order chemotherapy drugs. And when they do, their prescriptions must include only the generic name for the drug. Experts say these steps should help reduce errors at Duke. 
but the larger national problems require more fundamental changes. The problem is that the names are still alike. The problem is that the packaging is still out there. What we need to do is design systems, packaging, so that this kind of thing doesn't happen. Let me show you. One of the companies, as a matter of fact, uh, they took this because it was being uh, potentially being mixed up, and people complained about it. Look at the difference. This is the same drug in two different bottles. Look what can be done if people try. Okay. Tammy Quintero has a new baby boy, but says she still finds it hard to trust doctors, a feeling shared by all of the people we interviewed for this report, whose lives were torn apart because someone they loved was given the wrong medicine by professionals they trusted. For Tammy, even the most routine trips to her pediatrician are difficult emotionally. And what she finds even more difficult to accept is the fact that 13 months later, nobody at Duke has even apologized. I know they didn't mean to do it, but when I want to talk to my son now, I go to his grave. I ask a question, I don't hear his sweet little voice telling me, it's all right, Mama. Tammy Quintero told me if she ran a stop sign and killed a child, she'd likely face charges. And at the very least, she'd have her driver's license suspended, even though it was an accident. And yet at Duke, as in most of these medication mix-ups, no charges were filed, no licenses were suspended. Jane? How can you protect yourself and your family? Ask questions and don't be shy about it. If your doctor or nurse is about to make a mistake, having to answer even the simplest question about the drug or the dose may help them catch the mistake. At least that's something. Later in our program, an inspiring family story. We revisit two boys with Down syndrome who NBC first filmed 13 years ago, two very special young men. And up next, angry senior citizens who say they've been cheated out of their life savings by one of America's biggest political fundraisers, a man who targets older people's money. During the J.C. Penney Million Dollar Jewelry Sale, you'll discover some brilliant changes. Our entire selection of fine jewelry is priced at outstanding values. So now you can get giddy over gold, adorned with diamonds, and be jeweled by gemstones during the million dollar jewelry sale. Only two American made luxury automobiles provide both driver and passenger side airbags. One of them is a Lincoln. And the other one is a Lincoln. With Lincoln, it's easy to be on the safe side. Lincoln, what a luxury car should be. I believe babe is a four-letter word. I believe that the person who said winning isn't everything never won anything. I believe sweat is sexy. I don't believe in liposuction. I don't believe blondes have more fun. I believe in mass transit. I believe you should go big or stay home. I believe there's an athlete in all of us. Red Lobster may have gone too far this time. A full pound of tempting shrimp overflowing your plate. Red Lobster's never offered you, whoops, so much on one plate. 10 grilled shrimp. 15 butterfly, 11 scampi. A full pound of our biggest and best shrimp for a limited time. So much shrimp with all the extras, including a doggy bag. Red lobster for the seafood lover in you. Country crock churn style? Churn style. That sweet, buttery taste reminds me of dinner on the farm. Introducing the sweet, buttery taste of new Country Crock Churn Style. Like regular Country Crock, it has fewer calories and no cholesterol. Here's the answer to your tax headaches. The VO5 sweepstakes will pay 1991 personal federal income taxes for 100 winners. Details on VO5 shampoo and conditioner bottles and displays. Make tax time painless with Alberto VO5. 
Tomorrow morning on Today, a ranking of the 100 most powerful people in Hollywood. Also, tax day is almost here. Some expert tips on getting the most out of your return. Join us tomorrow morning on Today. Right now, the post office is being flooded by millions of letters. Requests for political contributions. Your name may be on some of those letters, but before you put a check in the mail, you should pay close attention to this next report. That's because while some solicitations are real, others are big ripoffs. Brian Ross has discovered that thousands of Americans, most of them elderly, have been fooled by one of the country's top political fundraisers. He's dropping some big names in politics without permission. He targets the elderly, and he's taking in millions of dollars in older people's money. This is where we came to investigate how someone in Washington has been making a lot of money. To Iowa corn country, to the small town of Webster, to this house on rural Route 1. 79-year-old Ruth Heaton lives here. Mrs. Heaton is one of the thousands of elderly Republicans around the country who have been getting a lot of mail from someone in Washington asking for money. Looks like it's about full. It's official-looking mail from the office of the chairman of something called the Reagan Political Victory Fund. Appeals for money to help keep the legacy of Ronald Reagan alive personally signed by Chairman Robert E. Dolan. He was a chairman. He called himself a chairman. Over the last two years, Mrs. Heaton, a lifelong Republican who thinks the world of Ronald Reagan, has sent Chairman Dolan and the Reagan Political Victory Fund much of her life savings, almost $25,000. You sent so much money to Mr. Dolan. Yes, I know I did. $25,000 just uh, the week But he find. was always needing money. I guess I felt sorry for him because he, he, he didn't seem to have any money. That's what he said in his letters to you? Mm-hmm. Mrs. Heaton's money and the money of thousands of others went to Washington, not to Ronald Reagan, but to this apartment in the Watergate, apartment 404 West, to this man, the chairman. Robert E. Dolan, a 36-year-old lawyer, little known in Republican circles. Dolan has no staff, no other job, and he is the chairman of nothing except some fancy-sounding committees he dreamed up himself. Records at the Federal Election Commission show this one-bedroom apartment in the Watergate is the headquarters of Dolan's big political operation. And it turns out According to the computer records we found here at the Federal Election Commission, that Dolan is one of the top money raisers in American politics. His committees, since 1984, have taken in more than nine million dollars. Nine million. Dolan's direct mail campaign is the envy of professional politicians in Washington, but it is also very misleading. In his letters, cleverly written, Dolan hits all the right buttons, pleading for money to help fight the liberals on Capitol Hill, to battle Ted Kennedy, to work for conservative causes. These letters make it seem that Chairman Robert Dolan is Ronald Reagan's man in Washington. When we asked to see Dolan, he refused to let us come to his headquarters at the Watergate. Instead, he came to our office and said that he operates like any other political action committee that takes in legal contributions for political campaigns. We're averaging about a million dollars a year in, in gross receipts. What does your political action committee stand for and what does it do? We began to support the Reagan presidency. Uh, the effort of Ronald Reagan, we felt, and I felt, and, and still feel, was, uh, was of monumental historical significance. But when we checked with former President Reagan, we found Mr. Reagan had never heard of Dolan. In a strongly worded statement to Dateline NBC, Mr. Reagan said Dolan had no authorization to use Reagan's name and that he has been ordered to stop it. But Dolan's Reagan fund is still in business. Here you are. This is Robert Dolan. Yeah. In Tama, Iowa, 95-year-old Mrs. Dana Chatlin 
proud to be helping Republican causes, sent Chairman Dolan all the money she had put aside for a nursing home. That's all I've got now is Social Security. I haven't got any extra money now. Here's another Dolan <laughs> letter. Dolan got more than $3,000 out of Mrs. Dagmar Cantola of Lantana, Florida, after he sent her letters claiming he might be forced to resign from his Reagan fund unless he got more money. Don't let the liberals, liberals win. Don't stand by and let the Reagan political victory fund be swallowed up. I'm desperate. Can you help out? And of all the people Dolan has conned with his slick mailings, no story is sadder than that of Ruth Heaton in Webster, Iowa, a widow who lives on $500 a month from Social Security. Mrs. Heaton's $25,000 makes her the single biggest contributor to Dolan's Reagan political victory fund. What I must tell you is that uh, no one has given more money in the last uh, year or two to Robert Dolan than yourself. Well, he won't get any more. In one shameless pitch, Dolan asked Mrs. Heaton to be a witness to a supposed last will and testament, claiming he was working so hard for Ronald Reagan he couldn't last much longer and that he needed another $2,000. Mrs. Heaton scribbled in response, my savings are gone. What would you say to him if you were to meet him? I'd call him a crook. because that's what he is. You feel he stole your money? Yes, I do feel. And I need my money. Do you know Mrs. Ruth Heaton of Webster, Iowa? I know of Ruth Heaton, yes. Who, who is she? Ruth Heaton is a contributor to conservative causes in Washington, D.C. Last couple of days. We then showed Dolan what Mrs. Heaton had to say about him. I'd call him a crook. She's talking about you. I, I, you're telling me that you, I could, I believe because that. that's what he is. You feel he stole your money? Yes, I do feel. And I need my money. This is Mrs. Ruthie. Yeah, I understand. I only get, uh, well, I don't get quite 500 a month. So I do need it. Have you stolen her money? Does she think she has? I don't think has? so. I, I think, I think what is... Have taken a lot of money from a lot of old people and sort of well, accuse them about who you are? I don't think so. Use names that don't really no. relate to what you're doing? Well, I don't think so, no. The people who work for Ronald Reagan say they never heard of you, but you have the Reagan Victory Fund. Right. Is what, that is that honest? Is that I think it's ter I think it's uh, honest as as all get up in politics. I'll be happy to talk about this for an extended period of time, right. but that's not a fair shot. I don't. That's Mrs. Ruth Heaton. I'll be happy to speak with her. She is not the biggest contributor According to American citizens. You filed. Well, maybe she is though. Now, how many contributors are to there to my political there action are thousands. Committee? How many? Thousands. How many? I don't know. How There's many more thousands. than thousands. To know we operate under the law of the United States of America. There has not been one breach of ethics, state, federal, or otherwise. But top Republican officials say what Dolan is doing is nothing but a scam, and it involves more than just the name of Ronald Reagan. Dolan has another letterhead for something he calls the Republican Senatorial Trust. We found that there really is a Republican Senatorial Trust located in this building on Capitol Hill, but it has nothing to do with Robert Dolan either. Jeb Henserling is the executive director of the real Republican Senatorial Trust. Have you ever met this Robert Dolan? I've never met the man, uh, and he is not the chairman of the Republican Senatorial Trust. Even though that letter says... He's not chairman of the Republican Senatorial Trust that has been established for over 15 years and is known throughout Republican circles in this nation. But so far, no one has been able to do anything about Dolan and the $9 million he has taken in because his committees are legally registered with the Federal Election Commission. But our investigation has found that of that $9 million, only about 1%, one penny per dollar, has gone directly to any candidate. When we went digging further to see what happened to all the money, we found that more than a half million dollars had been transferred by Dolan to accounts that he alone controls, for which there are no public records. 
A lot of the money, millions, has gone for the huge cost of the mailing campaigns themselves, done by a big direct mail company called Response Dynamics, whose executives would not talk to us on the record about their work for Robert Dolan. And a big chunk of the money has gone to support Dolan's playboy lifestyle. From what we could see, the same man who claimed he was working so hard for Ronald Reagan that he couldn't last much longer, hardly works at all. Dolan is a regular late night patron of Georgetown bars and clubs, best known in some Washington circles for his high stakes poker games. All paid for by Mrs. Heaton and Mrs. Cantola and Mrs. Chatlin and thousands of others who have sent their money, sometimes their last dollars, to Chairman Robert Dolan in Washington. It's outrageous, it really is. It makes you want to punch him in the nose. I mean, it, these are poor people. Senator Robert Dole, the Senate Minority Leader, says Dolan is a master at misleading and confusing people, once having used Senator Dole's name on one of his made-up committees. This was in 87 and 88 when I was out there running for president. We were having trouble raising money. I learned later this guy's out there, Americans for Dole, uh, reportedly raised about $3.9 million from a lot of people who thought they were giving money to Bob Dole for his presidential campaign. And we needed it, but we didn't get it. What do you think of Senator Dole? I think he's a great man. He's a great man? Here's what he has to say about you. Take a look at this. It's outrageous. It really is. It makes you want to punch him in the nose. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. He'd like to punch you in the nose. Well, yeah, I would let him. I would let him. He, you know. Why do you mean you'd let him? I'd let him because he's a great man. He says he'd like to punch you in the nose because what you're doing Sir, is outrageous. What you're doing now is outrageous. You're a liar and you're a national I just television. I want to ask you questions. You're I told a liar, you about but your no, political outside of committee. this room, what you did was say to me the area of the discussion yes. was going to be in a particular area. About you politics. want to go into this and discuss this is your it. politics. Listen, you're a liar. No. Well, I asked you questions about politics here, and Sir, you don't want to answer them. It's okay. I'm not a child, and you are. But not with me, you won't. Well. And I'll see you around sometime in other circumstances, all right? Mr. Dolan, I, I have a lot of questions I want to ask you. I, I, want, I want to talk to you too. I have a lot of questions I want to ask you about what Let's people say. Good day. Take care. Good day, America. Top Republicans now say the only way to stop Dolan is to close the loopholes in the campaign law. Uh, we have to change the law, and we, we better do it quickly because a lot of good people are going to lose, they're going to become more cynical about politics and politicians if we have leeches like Robert Dolan out there ripping them off. Fly across the lonely years. In the case of Mrs. Heaton, the Iowa Attorney General is now investigating Dolan for possible consumer fraud. And Mrs. Heaton's family is trying to get some of her money back from Dolan. All Mrs. Heaton can do is to warn her friends to watch out for any mail from Chairman Robert Dolan. I like to think of people as being um, honest. I'm honest myself, and I, and I guess I think other people should be too. Dolan says he has stopped using Ronald Reagan's name, but last week he sent out a new batch of letters, this time using the name of George Bush. We checked with the White House today, and they told us Robert Dolan is not authorized to use the president's name. Brian, how can he do this and not be prosecuted? Isn't this fraud? Postal authorities have refused again and again to go after Dolan and others like him. They say the First Amendment offers broad protection to any activity considered political, even Robert Dolan's activity. You know, with so many letters like this out in the mail, looking so official, how can you tell when it's a ripoff? The fact is, you really can't, Stone. Thanks, Brian. And still ahead tonight, we'll chart the extraordinary progress of two young men born with Down syndrome. A story of two families with great expectations. Next, on Dateline. If you want to paint like a professional painter, you need to develop all five senses. Your sense of color, your sense of balance, your sense of pride and craftsmanship, and most importantly, your sense of direction. There's only one paint this good, and there's only one place you can get it. The pros know. Ask Sherwin-Williams. Salon style reinvented. 
Now choose Salon Selective's new moisturizing styling products to moisturize and replenish, and botifying styling products to add volume. Choose to be your most beautiful. Butter? Philly. Thank you. Looks good, doesn't it? Ounce for ounce, Philly cream cheese has half the calories of butter or margarine. Next time, butter your bread with Philly instead. Next, when they were little, the experts said they couldn't learn, said there was no hope, but their parents refused to give up. And today, these extraordinary young people with Down syndrome are achieving what was thought impossible. Next on Dateline NBC. It's hipper and more aggressive, says Time Magazine. TV Guide calls their reporting solid, their interviews charged. He's morning television's top interviewer, says the Miami Herald. And she's been selected the best anchor of the morning by the Washington Journalism Review. Find out what the critics are raving about. Today, the best way to start your day. But I am coming before you to ask for mercy. She's convicted of torturing and killing her own son. Yet Ana Cardona begs the judge to spare her life. Three New York Mets are accused of rape. Today, the alleged victim told her story to police. We'll have details at 11 on the Channel 4 News Nightcast. Cops say his school part as the Grim Reaper became a deadly reality. Day of the Reaper. A cop affair on Channel 4 at 7 after NBC Nightly News. Just one look. And I knew, knew, knew that you. If you want to save time and money, all it takes is just one look in the real Yellow Pages. Just one look, that's all it took. Just one look, that's all it took. Eleven big hours. Tomorrow only. Fire and eleven hour sale. Get the right food, the right price at Fire Hey, you dropped a J. Police officers turn stars only on entertainment tonight. Our next story takes us on a remarkable 20-year journey as we watch two boys grow up, two boys with Down syndrome. And seeing Jane's story may change the way you think about Down syndrome. It's the most common form of congenital mental retardation, and for years doctors believed children with Down syndrome were too retarded to learn and routinely advised parents to institutionalize them. Now that's changed. Today, these two young men are looking forward to the future with great expectations, doing what their parents were told was impossible. The doctors literally told us that he wouldn't have a single meaningful thought in his head. The recommendation was that he be sent away to an institution at birth, that we tell our friends and family that he had died in childbirth. In 1974, Charles and Emily Kingsley were devastated when they learned their newborn son, Jason, had Down syndrome. We were lost. We didn't know which way to turn. And I remember feeling, don't get too close to this kid because he may break your heart. The Kingsleys overcame their fears and took Jason home. Three years earlier, in 1971, Mitchell Levitz was also born with Down syndrome. His parents weren't given much more encouragement than Jason's. What did the doctor tell you? That we probably shouldn't be having him at home. Um, and uh, not to expect a real lot. But Jack and Barbara Levitz refused to accept the conventional wisdom of the day that Down syndrome meant severely, unalterably retarded. We just decided to not take anything for granted and just try and give him opportunities and see what would happen. Back in the 1970s, that was a revolutionary idea. From the start, as these home movies show, Mitchell got the same attention as any child, but more of it. His parents played with him, worked with him. Today, it's known as early intervention. We first met Jason and Mitchell 13 years ago, before anyone knew for sure that early intervention would make a difference for children with Down syndrome. Their parents were pioneers who dared to ask, what if? What if we expected them to learn? Jason and Mitchell did learn. And this is the story of how two families helped change our expectations for children with Down syndrome. 
Clean, green, very good. And good. Ball. Mitchell Levitz was Ball. eight years old very when we good. first filmed him in school in 1979. Oh, he was a good student with exceptional drive and ability. Elephants what, Mitch? Elephants sleep standing up. Mm-hmm, we just said that. Elephants sleep standing up. What else? No, I mean elephants sleep standing up. Swim. Oh, they swim. Very good, Mitch. Mitchell was one of the first children with Down syndrome to take academic classes in a regular school to be mainstreamed. As a first grader, he needed extra help with his speech. But in math and reading, Mitchell was performing at grade level. At the time, his father didn't know how far he could go. Right now, he's learning a lot. We expect that at a certain time, this development is going to stop or slow down. And at, when that time comes, we'll just have to worry about it then. But Mitchell continued to exceed everyone's expectations. Five years later, when he was 13, he learned to read Hebrew, which meant his father's dream of a bar mitzvah could come true. Mitchell's success was extraordinary for a child with Down syndrome, and it inspired Jason's parents, who live nearby. The Kingsleys also started early. They began aggressive mental and physical stimulation when Jason was just 11 days old. Could you do a sign that if you're falling asleep in school and you're very bored, how do you say, that's sleep, how do you say, school? When Jason school, was four, he already class. knew sign language. And how about if you're falling asleep in school, how do you say, I'm bored? This is bored. <laughs> Early intervention had clearly paid off. Hey, so in 1979, the Kingsley sent Jason to a regular nursery school with kids his own age. He was already learning to read and spell words. Okay, all of the angles of a triangle are equal to how many degrees? Jason? Uh, 180. 180 degrees. So if I add up... Now Jason is in high school, and the benefits of his early intervention are obvious. Last year, at 17, we found him in a ninth grade class for kids with mild learning disabilities, taking the standard academic curriculum. You do the less than sign because it's going to the left, and then what's the value of the end point? Four. All right. Joan Jennings was Jason's teacher. Jason is very good at memorization. Um, I, I'm, I'm amazed by what he can memorize. He does very well in math. That's a real strength. What Jason is lacking in is conceptual thinking. Which means he has trouble applying what he learns, putting it all together, a common problem for people with Down syndrome. Early intervention doesn't make kids with Down syndrome smarter. It maximizes their learning potential. The majority will still have retardation in the moderate to mild range, with IQs from 50 to 70. Jason's IQ was a little higher. They develop different what? Different methods. It takes Jason longer to learn, but he works hard at it. With a lot of help and encouragement from his parents, he finished the ninth grade with a B minus average. Do you like school? I love school. Why do you love school? Because it gives me a chance to be more and more high-skilled for myself and my life, so I can lead my life into a good future. Up to now, starting with early intervention, the emphasis in Jason's life has been on all the things he can do. But the older he gets, the closer he comes to finding out what his limits are. Birthday coming up. What are you going to get for your birthday? What do you want? Uh, um, the one of my best things I want is a car. You like cars these like days? Cars, yeah. Yeah. It's very hard to get a car. What do you mean? My mom is still worried about me because of me going to the highway and getting an, an accident. He has all the same hopes, dreams, goals, plans of any other red-blooded American teenager. And that's got to break your heart sometimes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Early intervention has been a mixed blessing for Jason. It's enabled him to sample what life has to offer. But the world isn't always a friendly place for people with disabilities. In junior high, Jason was called a retard. Now in high school, the kids are nice to him, but he has almost no social life. 
Does he know what he's missing? Dating and all of that. Does he know what he's so. not yeah. included he in? He says, I yes. wish I were invited to more parties. He also says, I wish I didn't have Down syndrome. And that he says a lot. He says, I don't want to have Down syndrome. I wish it would go away. And, uh, and that's a, a good part of the pain. So his parents fill the lonely Step void after it. school and on weekends. But in the summer, Jason goes to a That's camp for disabled like kids where he met Tammy. She lives in Pittsburgh and also has Down syndrome. He's a pretty girl. She wrote me a first love letter. A love letter? Mm -hmm. What did she say? She says that want to get married, you want to lock lips and all that stuff. Lock lips? Yeah, yeah. Um, you mean kiss? Yeah, kiss, yeah. You think you might marry her? Yeah. She might be the one? She might be the one. Oh, never get away from me. So far, his parents have succeeded in giving Jason a fairly normal teenage life, which is bumpy in the best of circumstances. But they're anxious about what comes next. He and his friend Mitchell Levitz are among the first generation of people with Down syndrome to benefit from early intervention. Mitchell, three years older than Jason and leaving adolescence behind, is finding adult challenges are complicated. I checked the book. This is the person's name. We met Mitchell again last year when he was 20 years old and about to graduate from high school. Like Jason, he'd suffered the cruelties of classmates in junior high. Sisters Leah and Stephanie remember it well. Did Mitchell get a hard time from some kids? Yeah. There were a lot of problems. He, you know, the kids would, like, make fun, and he would mistake it for, like, laughing with. And then, you know, he used to go around kissing all the girls, and they didn't like that. But now he knows just to say hi. Learning the rules of social behavior has been hard for Mitchell, the final test of his maturity. But he's blessed with enormous self-confidence and has ambitious plans for the future. My next goal is to be in government. In the future, down the line, I want to be president of the United States. President of the United States? Yes. That's a very hard job. It is. Well, what would you want to do as president? How would you want to make a difference? Okay, uh, the one thing I want to do is to set up the, the national budget. That's the first thing. The second thing is to put in more services uh, for the for the mental, for the mental retardation. Mitchell has personal goals too. Like Jason, he wants to get married. Well, I know it is highly irregular for for a person like me to get married. But you think you could do it? Yes, because of the way I show my charm. Your charm. Yeah. Yes, you, you are a person of some charm. I'm an expert. <laughs> hey, Janet. You uh, look very, uh, very attractive Thank this you. evening. This was Mitchell's senior prom. Yeah. He invited Janet Dill, a girl in his high school who also has Down syndrome. Here's two two of you. Have yeah. a wonderful evening. Okay. Here, here. Keep your eyes on me. Little smiles say marvelous. 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 Hey. Mitchell's high expectations probably made it harder for him to accept his disability. But now that he has, he's much better equipped to handle the challenges of being an adult. Mitchell Levitz. Last June, Mitchell Andrew Levitz graduated from high school. To do so, he had to pass five New York State Regents exams, like everyone else. His family was not alone in recognizing his remarkable achievement. Mitchell got a standing ovation. People really picked up on Mitchell's success and felt good about it. Mitch, you be cool, all right? He has more determination than probably anyone I know. Like, this graduation, there was really never any doubt for him. We had doubt, but he didn't. Where's Dad? Dad! Oh, God, Mitchell, I'd be so proud of you. Today, Mitchell is living in South Orange, New Jersey. So this is your new neighborhood? Uh, yes. You don't even live in the same state as your parents anymore. No, actually, it's uh, much different, and I like it. For the last six months, he shared a supervised apartment with three other disabled men. Okay, guys, dinner is served. Mitchell is learning the skills he'll need to live on his own. He's the first resident with Down syndrome. He also has a part-time job at a bank, counting coins and getting them ready to ship out. And he's still hoping to run for political office. You're a dreamer. I may be a dreamer, 
but that what people should, should think about dreams and goals. That's the essence of Mitchell's message. The building blocks of dreams and goals are early intervention, appropriate education, and the love of a devoted family. His goal is to make them the birthright of every child with Down syndrome. People in the community should have their minds open and realize that people with disabilities are individuals. We need more chances to be successful in the real world. With the support of our families and communities, we can reach our potential. Mitchell's next goal is an apartment of his own. All along, that's been the ultimate goal, independent living. Is that realistic? Or he hears that word a lot from his dad. He'll live in the group home for two to four years, learning how to hold a job, manage money. In the meantime, he and Jason are writing a book about growing up with Down syndrome. They are so remarkably unimpressed with their own accomplishments. They just don't expect anything less of yeah. themselves. We will be back in a moment. Now that I've permed my hair, it needs special care. Introducing Permavive Technicare by L'Oreal. Shampoos, conditioners, treatments with a unique polymer complex. A new science to bring back the healthy feel and help keep curls curling. Permavive, re-energizing, replenishing, rebalancing. Healthy curls, healthy hair. New Permavive Technicare by L'Oreal. Advanced Technology Perm Care. You're about to see how Goodyear is changing all season driving right before your eyes. Introducing AquaTread, only from Goodyear. AquaTread's advanced design channels water out of your way for dependable all season traction, especially in the rain when you may need it most. AquaTread, the newest reason why we say the best tires in the world have Goodyear written all over them. If I had a choice, I wouldn't get them. My second choice, a fast cure. I hate vaginal yeast infections, but I get them over and over. Well, my doctor said a woman should first see a doctor for an initial diagnosis. After that, use gynolotrimin. She said it starts working fast to help bring your infection under control. Gynolotrimin is her choice now. And my choice, I still wouldn't get them. But when I do, I want a fast cure. Gynolotrimin, make your choice a fast cure. I want to show you why my Dirt Devil is the world's best-selling corded hand vacuum. Okay, Sam. Now, the toughest test for any vacuum is pet hair. So I gave my Dirt Devil a strong motor and a revolving brush, just like an upright. And if it's powerful enough to clean up this mess, imagine what it can do with a dirty carpet. You could say Dirt Devil is man's best friend. Well, almost. So get a Dirt Devil and put the power of an upright in the palm of your hand. Where is it written that prices have to go up? Not at Walmart. We're rolling up our sleeves and rolling back prices on hundreds of items. Roll back America. It's not a sale. It's a commitment to save you money wherever we can. Rolling up our sleeves. Rolling back the price together. Roll back America. Roll back America. New lower prices at Walmart. Roll back America. Always the low price. Always. Tune in to Jay Leno tonight. You also get Celine Dion and Peebo Bryson. Then on late night, cigars, cigarettes, Kathy Moriarty. No contest tonight. It's been open season on sports heroes lately, though many of the wounds are self-inflicted. And for a while, it seemed as if Michael Jordan had become another fallen hero. On further reflection, maybe he only tripped. Which brings us to the final dateline tonight. North Carolina. Ten years ago this week, Michael Jordan's jump shot won a championship for the University of North Carolina. And in the decades since, he has entertained us and enthralled our children, sometimes leaving basketball fans wondering how long any human could possibly stay airborne or whether he'd come down at all. Predictably, he has. First, Jordan uh, is now under the magnifying uh, glass for gambling and losing more than $100,000. There's nothing wrong with uh, friendly wages between friends. Playing golf and poker with people, some would argue, he shouldn't have been playing with in the first place. 
That news didn't go down well back home in North Carolina. When we saw this headline in a Greensboro paper, we thought his image had been permanently tainted. When the hometown folks call you dirt, who'll stand by you? Michael's mom was asked last year if all the pressure on her son was fair. She said, as long as you understand he's human, he makes mistakes. Do people understand? Well, back home, the Michael Jordan story has vanished from the headlines, and people sound sympathetic. If it would change anything, it would make me think he's more down to earth and normal like everybody else. <laughs> Michael Jordan may be more human than we knew, but perhaps he won't be made to pay the ultimate price for his indiscretions. So far, Gatorade, Nike, and Wheaties, among his commercial sponsors, have decided to stand by their man. Barring further revelations from the character cops, and they're out in force this year, that could be the last word. Well, the character cops over at the NBA headquarters here in New York are concerned enough about this to have met with Michael Jordan today. He was in town to play the Knicks. Uh, but given his value to the league, I suspect they're as hopeful as he is that all this will blow over in a couple of days. Yeah. We'll be back in a minute. The stranger and his trusty grill stood ready for the fight. Other sauces gets bullseye to see which tasted right. And as the smoke rose off his grill, Hunts was laid to waste. The masterpiece and Heinz dropped out against bullseye big bowl taste. Yes, the stranger had won the day with a sauce that beat the rest. The big bowl taste of bullseye tastes the best. And now there's bullseye's bold and chunky with big chunks of onion and green peppers. He vowed he'd return to prove their love affair with butter didn't have to end because of cholesterol. Jimmy, you're back. This is for you. I can't believe it's not butter. I can't believe it's not butter, the taste you love without the cholesterol. Most eye doctors agree dry, irritated eyes should be treated. And doctors agree dry, irritated eyes can be effectively treated with soothing, cooling Visine Extra. Visine gets the red out. Next on the Channel 4 News Nightcast, an arsonist returns to a Broward high rise. Residents are feeling the heat. A suspected rapist behind bars in Fort Lauderdale. Well, the Florida Supreme Court ruled on the controversial issue surrounding the saga of little baby Teresa. And have you ever tried to beat the train? Plenty of people do, and the police crackdown is on. The Nightcast is next. Eyewitness video, real stories, real video. See the show that stunned 34 million viewers. NBC presents a return of Eyewitness Video Sunday at 7, 6 Central. They're the shattered victims of the Cambodian War, struggling to rebuild their world. Find out how American veterans are helping them start a new life tomorrow on NBC Nightly News. Now some of the stories you'll be seeing next week on Dateline NBC. Give us an author. Is your child getting a fair chance in school? She's looking through a forest of girls' hands to boys who are on the periphery. Jane will take you inside our schools to see if there's a gender bias in your child's classroom. And Michelle Gillen takes us inside the National Weather Service to show us why they miss so many deadly storms. Who's responsible for your husband's death? The administration of that weather service. It's a political and financial scandal that could threaten your safety. All that's ahead on Dateline. And tomorrow morning, what's on today, Bryant? Jane, tomorrow morning on today, we'll talk with John Frohmeyer, his first interview since being bounced as head of the NEA. Also, with April 15th just around the corner, we'll have some important tax tips, plus an undercover report from Las Vegas on a phone scam that's ripping people off all across the country. All that, plus a ranking of the 100 most powerful people in Hollywood. Tomorrow morning on today. Jane? Thank you, Bryant. And tune in tomorrow for Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. And Jane and I will be back next week for all of us here at Dateline NBC. Good night. A transcript of this program, please send a $5 check or money order to NBC News Transcripts, Box 7, Livingston, New Jersey, 07039.